there's a fungus among us, or what I like to refer to as the exolyte blight. <laughs> so we have our knobs in front of us, and if you notice, they have this white substance on them. It's a type of fungus. And if you could smell through the camera, you would realize that they smell, well, somewhat like human vomit. Yes, they smell really bad. So why do I call it the exolyte blight? Well, <laughs> back in the 1970s and 80s, the Exolite company, who makes a lot of hand tools, especially that electronic folks use, like these ones, which are some of my favorite tools. Um, I've had them for many years, and I love them. That's I use them every day. And we use them a lot at work because they're so portable. You can get this handle with all these interchangeable bits, and it's easy to carry in your toolkit when you're out in the field. But one thing that Exolite and a lot of the companies of that era used at the time for, for the handles has a, has a flaw in it. And the flaw is the type of plastic that they're using for the handle. And that plastic quite often, uh, not always, but quite often they use is called cellulose acetate butyrate, or CAB, C-A-B. And one of, and I'm not a chemist, I don't really understand all of this, but from what people have explained to me and what I could find on the internet or whatever, the main problem, and I don't know if it's a byproduct uh, of the chemicals they use to make this type of cab plastic, or if it's something they use in the plastic, but there is something called butyric acid. And butyric acid, by its nature, is something that's contained in human vomit. That is why the familiar smell. And these screwdrivers, this being one of them, if they're kept in a damp and dark environment, like in a basement or something, or high humidity area, they, the, the butyric acid will leach out of the plastic. It will react somehow with the moisture in the air and you'll get this fungus that grows on it and you will get the characteristic smell of vomit. No, I'm not kidding you. And if you could smell this handle, this handle was completely white. Uh, when I moved, some of this stuff went into storage tubs and went into a storage unit for a couple of years, several years. And during that period of time, it was closed up in a plastic case in a very high humidity area. And this entire handle was covered with that white stuff. And even though you can clean it off, you cannot remove that odor. So anytime you get your nose up close to this handle, you can smell it. <laughs> it's bad. And uh, even the ones that have never had this, so this one has never been stored away. It's under normal use. And you notice it never got that fungus on it. But if you s smell it, you can just barely catch a hint of that odor. So why am I saying all this? Well, these knobs are made of that same kind of plastic. And what I found is there is no actual chemical that will that I know of that will deactivate that this stuff. You basically just have to scrub it off. I've tried ultrasonic cleaners, I've tried all kinds of different things. And kind of the reason I'm doing this little introduction Number one, to let, let those of you who don't know about it, you know, what this is. But second of all, if any of you do know of some type of chemical that will react with this and or, or neutralize the, that smell and that will break down this fungus very easily that makes it easier to clean, I would really appreciate it. But I've tried vinegar, I've tried baking soda with water, I've tried ultrasonic cleaners. It seems like what works the best is just a heavy duty degreaser like Simple Green or Formula 409 or something like that. Soak it real well and then just scrub it off with an old toothbrush or something like that. So that's what we're going to do first of all is get these cleaned up because we are still waiting for components to come in. I have two more days according to uh, tracking the UPS shipment 
and we should have our parts to be able to continue on with our restoration. So let's get these cleaned up and uh, can't get rid of the smell but we can get rid of the crud. So here's what I use for cleaning this, these knobs that get this on it. I use a product called Simple Green because I guess it's simple to use and it's green. <laughs> but uh, a great you can get a large container of it and it's not that expensive and it's concentrated so you just use a little bit of it with some hot water which we have here and we're just going to take our knobs and throw them in there and the simple green even has a kind of a mint smell to it so that kind of masks I will say it doesn't remove the smell but it masks the bad smell and the other thing you have to remember about these knobs is if you don't get them really really clean and get most of that material off of there that butyric acid if it gets in your skin it's hard to wash off and it stinks <laughs> so your fingers will smell bad so we definitely want to clean this stuff off and uh, this is how I do it. It seems to work really well compared to most of the other methods that I've tried. So hot water mixed with you know this type of a degreaser, biodegradable degreaser, whatever, and uh, let's see how it works. Well I don't know what amuses me more. The fact that I'm making a video of cleaning vomit smell off of a knob <laughs> or that somebody actually is out there watching a video of somebody cleaning vomit smell off of a knob. So, uh, yeah. Anyway, hey, you know, we have to have fun and occupy our time sometimes. Maybe this is entertaining. I don't know. But this is how I do this. And, again, like I said, this tends to work pretty well without... Some, sometimes that this white fungus will harden as, after it sits for a long enough time, especially if you take it out of the humid environment and you let it dry. That fungus will actually harden and it gets really difficult. Sometimes you almost have to scrape it off to get it, to get it out. But uh, this one's not, these knobs aren't so bad yet. They were just starting to go. And both radios have it, as a matter of fact, so tells me that it's, you know, these knobs must be that type of CAB plastic uh, from that era. I don't know. Again, this is 19, what do we say, 1958, somewhere around then. And, of course, the Exolite tools are more from the 1970s and 80s. So... You know, they must have had this type of plastic clear back then, you know. So, you can see it scrubs right up. And these, this one cleaned up really well. So, I'm going to do all the other ones. And uh, I just wasted how many minutes of your time watching me scrub vomit off of a knob. Oh, well. Sorry. After completing the scrubbing of the vomit-smelling fungus while being reminded of my college years, we can take both of those bad memories and repress them to the back of my mind where they belong. We are now done with step one, and we're now started on step two, which is where I'm going to take this product called Quick Glow. Uh, several of you viewers turned me on to this stuff, and I absolutely love it. This is the fine. They have uh, standard, fine, and coarse. And this stuff works really well. It works for metal, like for metal polishing, but it also works with polycarbonate and mirrors and things like that. And the reason I like it is when you look at this coating here, this brass insert they put, that's just a really thin plating they put on there. And if you use anything at all, even some chemicals, it'll take that brass plating right off. So this stuff is so delicate that if you just do one little application of it, it polishes this up really well without removing the plating. It also works on the plastic 
and really shines it up. So here's a before. You can kind of see how it looks. And here's an after. So it takes a little bit of elbow grease and a little bit of time, but you can get these knobs to look really well. And then I use these little Sharpie paint pens with the fine tip, and you can use them to fill in the little pointer. That pointer is uh, indented in there. You can see that one's, it's all rubbed off. And that'll kind of restore that. So these are gonna turn out pretty well, I think. I'm cleaning up the face plate now, and it polished up pretty well. But you have to be really careful you don't rub any of the letters off. There's a teeny little bit of pitting right there, and that's about all. The rest of it's pretty clean. And that's like a plating on there. This, however, is pot metal. And it's got like a gold paint on it, and it cleaned up pretty well also. But you got to watch, because you could rub right through that paint. So you have to be very careful polishing that. You don't want to use too much chemical or anything like that. Now the problem is these screws are so tight they'll almost strip or break off when you remove them. You have to be very careful removing them. And it's because this pot metal will kind of expand and contract with age and it'll tighten up on these metal screws, these steel screws. So what I'm going to do before putting this back together is I'm just chasing these holes with a tap. And this is just a 440 tap. This is a standard 440 screw thread. And I'm just driving these down in here and then backing them out and making sure because those screws were so tight they would strip. And you could see taking them out, you see how that pot metal just kind of breaks off in there and gets in the threads. So I'll take a wire brush and just kind of clean that stuff off of the threads there too. And then we'll put it all back together and see what it looks like. Well, I think we can pretty much see why a lot of the tuner section doesn't work so well and why I had to wiggle the tubes around. Look how green and corroded all of these sockets are. And they're all pretty much like that, with the exception of the output tube and the rectifier. All of them are dirty like that. So these are all going to really need cleaned, and some of them may be so bad that we may even have to replace them. I hope not, but possibly. Oh yeah, it is playing beautifully. This thing is dead silent with the old capacitors, except that one cap being changed, everything original. And it is absolutely awesome sounding. The tuner still does not work. The We did clean the tube sockets. Those are all good. Our voltages are good. But we certainly still have some issues in the tuner. But as we, could, we saw earlier uh, in an earlier video, we are picking up stations, uh, at least at the RF portion of the tuner. So there's something in the IF that's not working right. But uh, how's it look? It's put together, it's looking pretty good, cleaned up pretty nice. It's not perfect, but it is working. Okay, just for a little update here, I'm going through all this mess and kind of cleaning everything out. Uh, one of the things I found was the coupling capacitor, which is, let's see here, it would be this one right here, which this is marked incorrectly, it should be a 0 0.02 microfarad. That was actually, and this one was a ceramic, which a lot of these old Fisher amps do this, but you can see this one's kind of cracked and it's kind of gross looking. So I'm removing the ceramic. They tend to be microphonic sometimes anyway. Some of them are, some of them aren't. So I'm going to, re I just replaced it with one of these. Uh, nice Solon. Uh, film capacitor and while I was looking through there I found this resistor which looked kind of strange and when I measured it, it, it it's orange white brown at least from what we can see on there and that should be 390 ohms and it's reading almost 2k 2000 ohms when I looked it up in the schematic, however, 
it definitely does not look correct because that actually turns out to be this resistor right here which is supposed to be a 400 ohm at 5 watt and when I look in the parts list as I bang the camera right there it says 400 ohms 5 watts and then there's a note and it says some versions may use 920 ohms in this application so it's somewhere between a 400 and a 920 ohm so that 390 ohm makes sense that would be close to 400 however it is not 5 watts and that's probably why it burned up and looking on the schematic once again this is actually across this 100 microfarad capacitor for your negative 36 volts and I'm assuming the reason they want that to be so accurate is they don't want it to heat up and drift whatever voltage it is they want it to stay at that voltage now I do not have a 400 nor a 920 ohm 5 watt resistor but I do have a 470 ohm flame proof that will not drift and I have a feeling if I put that 470 in there looking at that circuit it is not going to affect anything at all I think it'll be just fine. The only thing is you can see they're saying 5% and again I think they're more looking for it not to drift and this also is your your negative for your 420 volt source up here. You can see it's not referenced your 420 volt source is not referenced directly to ground it's actually referenced to the negative 36 volt right here and then it finds ground through here so all your grounds are going through that resistor and I think that's why this resistor has overheated and changed and the funny thing is when I touched it it came right off so it looks as if it may not be factory and it may have been replaced because as you can see from this mess there's been a lot of work and look at how many hook and pinches were on this thing unbelievable so I know none of that's original so we're just going to go through and uh, I'm going to put that 470 in there and if I, I'll, I'll do some testing if it looks like it's any problem I will have to special order a 400 ohm to be in there but uh, I have a feeling the 470 will work just fine so just as I suspected as soon as I heated up the other leg on this this just kind of pulled out it was just kind of laying in there and you can see how they kind of bent it over and then this top wire here which I was on there that's the actual what's left of the lead from the original resistor that was in there so this was definitely replaced and I don't know why somebody would put a half watt resistor in place of where there was a you know a five watt but apparently they didn't think it would be that big of a deal but you can see that piece there and I'll fish that out when we're off camera but so we're gonna get that replaced and hopefully that will take care of that I would say that is some serious hook and pinch activity going on there <laughs> but they got it in there I'm looking at this second unit now and it's actually been mostly recapped and they did a mostly decent job doing it but because uh, I'm waiting for the a couple more parts to come in for the other one so while I'm waiting I figured I'd throw this one on the bench and this cap was kind of had some flying leads out here and it was kind of touching almost on this resistor so I'm going to shorten the leads on this one it's still a good it's a spray atom it's a really good cap and while I was in here I noticed look at this cap the ends pretty much blown out of it it's messed up and this amp actually worked the other thing uh, while I was in here if we look right up here remember in that other one we had that little half watt uh, 390 ohm resistor this is what should be in there 400 ohm 5 watt so you can see that's what belongs in there 
This is an older build date also. The one we had was a newer build date, I believe. And instead of those little brown ceramic capacitors, it uses these white ones for every single little ceramic capacitor like that. So you can see they're all like that. And there are a couple of paper. They left this one and this one for some reason. Those are the only two paper caps they did not replace. And they left the two death capacitors in here, which did not even exist in, in the other one, if you recall. So I'm going to go through and just do a couple checks of some resistors, clean up a few of the things that probably just could be a little bit neatened up. But other than that, this one actually is in fairly decent condition. Now that we have this cap out, you can kind of see what the damage on it. And it looks like it's totally shot, doesn't it? But here's the strange thing is we'll take this thing and connect it to this little tester just real quickly. Just, just a quick test. And it's reading a little bit high. The ESR doesn't look bad. <laughs> the cap somewhat checks good. But you can see it clearly has damage on it. So we're going to replace it. And I don't really know if this is why this happened. But it looks like something shorted out at some point. So wouldn't you know, as I took that capacitor lead off, and unwound it, I found out that the actual terminal was snapped. And here's the end of the terminal. And uh, so rather than replace the whole socket, I'm going to just replace the pin. You can see. And to do that, you take an old socket. And you can see this one has a couple pins that were never used. It's in good shape. And if you notice, the way these are, they're just kind of folded. You can kind of see that there. They have like a, a bump in them. And all you do is take your needle nose pliers and you just give it a really good pinch to flatten it out. And then you come up and just push down and the pin pushes right out and you can remove it. Now we can insert this in the old socket and you can see I have that and I just kind of cleaned it off a little bit. And we can just replace the one pin rather than replacing the whole socket. The socket's actually in good condition. The pins are very clean. They're not tarnished. So there's really no reason to replace the whole socket. Good thing I tested this capacitor. Not only is it leaking, but there's almost no deflection whatsoever on the capacitance check mode. So this cap is bad also and it needs replaced. And I do have another one, so we're good. Okay, so the parts came in, and I got the last resistors put in. The amplifier sounds absolutely amazing. All of the voltages seem to be good, but no tuner action. Now I'll show you where, where, where we are with it. If we look right here, we can trace it all the way through here. And if we test up to this point right here, so where we're coming off of here and going into there, we can get the signal. So that represents this transformer right here. And if you listen to the signal tracer, I don't know if you can hear that. So it's there, however, if we look at the output of the transformer, which is this one down here, which is right here, totally dead. That leads up to the FM coil, which is right there, which should come out here, which should go into pin one of your first first FM and AM IF amp. So it's a shared tube. And we should get right here, we should see a pretty strong IF signal right here. 
and it's gone. So that's telling me, and let me turn that signal tracer off, that's telling me that we have a bad transformer and that doesn't surprise me. If we zoom in, you can just see how just absolutely crusty, corroded they are. So I have a bad feeling that some or maybe all of these transformers, and you can see there's one here, there's one down here, there's one here, there's one here, one here, <laughs> up here, and yet another here. So there are quite a few of them and every one of them could be bad with that silver mica disease. So this could be a major undertaking because if you look at all the terminals you have to desolder and take off of there to get these apart and these are not fun to do. That might be what we have to do. So I'm going to start at the beginning. I mean this transformer here is working. So maybe this one is the one that's causing all the problems. And if we get it fixed, maybe the rest of them will luck out and it'll work. Keep your fingers crossed. I don't think I'd even call that silver mica disease. I'd call that <laughs> IF can corrosion disease. Look at all that. Yeah, I would say that's going to need repaired. Now, I think the bigger problem here is finding what this capacitance is because it's that there's no way we're going to be able to measure that so we're going to have to do a little digging on this and find out unless they put which they did not the unfortunate thing is this is one of those schematics that does not tell you what value of capacitor is in there and that is extremely important so Time to do a little research. Well, I've got this one cleaned out and put back together, and we're going to have to get the correct capacitors, which from my what I'm seeing, I think these are going to be about 100 uh, picofarads on each side, but we'll test those. But I think, and you could see, there were two layers of this. One layer turned completely to mush and just disintegrated. This one here was the better of the two layers of mica, and you can see how bad it was. So this there was no really repairing it. So as a result, we're going to probably have to do all of them. I don't know, but if that one's that bad, I would have to imagine the other ones are also, at least to some degree, going to be bad. So we'll get into doing how to rebuild these and testing them in the next video because this is getting you know, just keeps adding on and on. I need to kind of go through all the clips I've taken over the last couple of weeks and we'll get it edited. And uh, I'm going to stop this video right here and we'll get it posted. And when we come back on the next uh, part of the series, we'll finish fixing the transformers and getting the receiver aligned. And then we'll do a proper test of the amplifier, which I'm sure all of you are kind of waiting to see. I can tell you my preliminary test, this thing is going to be pretty, pretty amazing for just an old mono amplifier. And if possible, maybe we'll try out a new piece of test equipment, but it just depends if I have time to figure out how to set it up and use it and so forth. So in the meantime, as always, I wish you all peace, joy, happiness, and good health in your lives. And we'll see you again real soon. Take care. Bye-bye.